Welcome to another episode of The Theater Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Seals. And I'm your producer, Jillian Hockman. How you doing? I'm so great. How are you? Oh, I'm I'm very happy, very elated. We I just got out of the, the interview with Patty Murin. Oh, love her so much. And I I gosh, we got on some really weird topics like uploading your consciousness to artificial intelligence and becoming, you know, that sounds uh, an, like an, something an, you would talk about. Yep. <laughs> becoming an eternal being in the cloud. Huh. Um and it was funny because we were talking about that kind of in relation to mental health, which she's very known for because uh, it was it was kind of fun for me to say, like, would you patch yourself? Would you fix vulnerabilities? Would you take away some of these things that make you kind of, um, uh, you know, more human? And she's like, absolutely not. I would not. You know, she wants to 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 still be a, be a computer that deals with anxiety and deals with <laughs> depression, but also is peppy and upbeat and and happy and fun. But my gosh, it was an incredible conversation, and it actually got me for the first time. You'll hear about in talking about my own mental health diagnosis, which I've never talked about before. The first time for everything on this podcast, <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's like it's like a weight, like a secret I've had is out in the open. A weight's been lifted off of me. And it's not even a big deal. You well, that's, I mean? that's the whole point. That's the point that Patty's making, that you can be you and you can be open and there's nothing wrong with that. And that is okay. And it's something that you can talk about. And it's 2019, damn it. <laughs> you do you. Yeah. Well, even, I mean, we've talked about this with others on the podcast that, that in this country specifically, there's a lot of stigma around mental health, whereas in other countries, it's just kind of not there. But, you know, from what Patty's doing, and then, you know, you've got Kristen Bell and Mark Ruffalo and so many other big celebrities who are who are opening up about their own struggles with mental health. And I think it's, it's important to talk about. But, you know, Frozen... So Frozen on Broadway just celebrated their uh, their year. Congratulations, Frozen. Congratulations, Frozen. You are now officially a year old on Broadway. Um, and unfortunately, sad face, this is the last episode we will release as part of the Frozen takeover. But um, if you want to go back and get more episodes with Frozen cast members, of course, we did Joe Carroll and then Ryan Redmond and Noah J. Ricketts. And so now, please enjoy this episode with Patty Murin. She made her Broadway debut in 2007 in Xanadu and then originated the title character of Lissa Strata Jones in 2011. She's been Glinda in the first national tour of Wicked in 2012 and uh, is pathologist Nina Shore on the NBC medical drama television series Chicago Med. Now playing Anna in Frozen the Musical on Broadway, Patty Murin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. You're very chipper. I am. That's just a general, general Patty-ness. <laughs> <laughs> public public patty yeah no yeah. all the time really oh yeah yep um well i want to i want to get back into um like the very beginnings of kind of where where it all started where did you grow up i grew up just north of new york city um in a small town called hopewell junction um just south of poughkeepsie mm -hmm. <laughs> i know hopewell junction I'm, I mean, I'm trying to place it i'm just like silence is me going through my bad geography of this area it's just like directly up the hudson basically Okay. It's like an hour and 15 minutes. So yeah. so then where did the, did you come to the city a lot? What? How did you get into musical theater? Yes. My parents are massive musical theater fans, massive Broadway fans. They don't perform at all. They're just pure fans. And so they, we grew up with them taking me and my three siblings uh, all the time. My grandma would take us to shows. My first show was Cats when I was six. Yeah, I'm a cliche. I know. Um, and <laughs> mine, mine was Phantom. So oh, see, yes, there you yes. go. It's kind of nice. You're like, yeah. yeah, it was like something kind of iconic as opposed to like, you know, I went to see this thing that like closed in five minutes later that no one's ever heard of. Right. Um, so yeah, so that was Cat Starlet Express. I saw that. Um it, it's it it I grew up loving theater. And my dad had, you know, all the the cast recordings and stuff, and so we would Listen to them and listen to the cassette tapes in the car and the cassette tapes. <laughs> yeah. Cassette tapes. Yeah. Oh yeah, because I think you are three weeks older than me. I, I did read that. Yeah. Really? So, yes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. So cassette tapes, indeed. Yes. I I listened to my parents' cassette tapes in, yep. the, in the same way, and I believe yeah, my mother was really into cats too. Yeah. Because she was a dance major. Oh. So she did the whole dancing and musical theater thing. Oh wow. Yeah. And that's yep. That's definitely a that's a dance and there's dancing cats in that one. Yes. <laughs> Those cats do dance. <laughs> <laughs> and she likes cats, so it was kind it's of the perfect literally musical. Literally perfect, yes. It is perfect. Per oh my god! See what you did Could there? go for days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So what do your parents actually do, though, besides, besides from being fans of theater? Um, my dad was a, an eighth grade biology teacher um, for 35 years. He retired as soon as he could. He was like, done. That's it. My mom, she was a, she was a stay-at-home mom, and she stayed home and raised us and you know, fed us and clothed us and drove us around and basically made us the adults that we are today. <laughs> How many of, of us are there? There's four of us. So there's my sister is three years older than me. My brother is a year older than me. Then there's me. And then 10 years later, there's my little brother. <laughs> 10 years later? Yeah. Wow. I yeah. guess you, I, I've got two little ones and I'm like, I need to get yeah. the diapers out of the house and yep. I don't think I want them again. My mom just has always loved babies. That's what also makes her a really good grandma as well mm -hmm. um, because she just, she loves her grandkids so much, you know, but then she can give them back now. <laughs> <laughs> That's all, yeah, that's always a nice thing is like, I, I like giving my kids away, Yeah. but being a parent now, I like to get them back. Yeah, oh, that's nice to hear. But man, I love to give them away. Yeah, yeah. The giving away makes it what's great to get them back. Yeah. I would assume. I guess, you know, the grass is always greener, right? Yeah. So, you know, you give away the kids. My two and a half year old is such a little jerk right now. Yeah, oh. He's, but he is so sweet. Yeah. I love him. And he looks at you and he's like, how can I just, oh. sch I'm scheming, I'm breaking. It's like they're figuring out how where their lines are, like what oh, lines yeah. they can cross and how to like manipulate. Oh, the boundaries. It's so weird. But I'm, I'm trying to be an intentional parent. Right. Mm -hmm. And I I want to, like right now, they're one day going to be, they're going to grow up and they'll be like, oh, daddy interviews Broadway people or daddy's involved with theater or however, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be when they finally realize this, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I struggle with like, do I... I guess, do I encourage them to follow this unknown, stressful, right. not a lot of money in most cases kind of career path or go down something? Send them to dental school. <laughs> That's what I tell everyone. Go to dental school. Oh, I listen to my mom. I got a computer science degree. That, well, that's useful. It is. Yeah. Yes, I science those computers. There you go. But okay, back to you because um, <laughs> we're not here to talk about me. <laughs> When did you first figure out you could sing? I kind of decided I could sing. It was probably like, I don't know, sixth grade. They did a massive sixth grade production of um, Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. Can you imagine that? With literally 150 11-year-olds. 150? Yes. My sixth, it was a weird setup with the elementary schools all feeding into the same sixth grade. Um, so there was so many students. I was um, a mouse. There were 18 mice in the musical. <laughs> <laughs> My name was Tina. <laughs> Tina. <laughs> Tina. Tina the mouse. And I was, I remember like, because when, <laughs> when they gave us our parts, everyone auditioned, everyone got a part, obviously. When they gave us our parts, they handed us like, they, we had envelopes, you know, like uh -huh. at the end of the day, all the teachers would hand out the envelopes. We all like opened them. And one of my best, my two best friends in my class were both stepsisters. There were also, we had three stepsisters. <laughs> <laughs> the teacher, I imagine the teachers are sitting there like, how can we not cut anybody? And then 150 kids later, we have like... There were a lot of feature dancers. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of townspeople. Yeah, my, a lot of mice, three stepsisters. I'm trying to think what... Else. We also had, um, I don't know why this was necessary, but they added um, a song called We Love to Cook, um, but it was set to Under the Sea. What? So we also had two chefs. <laughs> You know when you say something that you like know is a part of your history, but as you say it out loud, you're like, that is a bonkers. <laughs> How have I never talked about this before? <laughs> so, uh -huh. um, and we sang mostly to pre-recorded music, but sometimes we had a piano and we had one flute player and like one violin <laughs> because they were also sixth graders. So they used them very sparingly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, this is hilarious. Do you happen to have a VHS recording of this? Oh, my dad converted it to DVD. Oh boy. So I have, and there are some people in this city that I could torment. Oh yes. One of my um, good friends growing up is now um, an agent at Innovative. No kidding. And yeah, oh yeah, he, uh, he's, he's got a, a dancing part that I could, <laughs> that I could show the world and I keep threatening to do it. <laughs> oh man, I, I, think that would be super fun to just kind of leak that out yep. on the internet just one a little day. bit yep and yep. it was before puberty you know so he's just like his one line is in the stratosphere yep. yeah totally yeah yep. yeah well then that was that yeah it was that audition that I was like my mom was like what do you can you sing and I was like yeah <laughs> I don't know of course I can and so I sang but I think I sang my favorite things that's what it was like my favorite things happy birthday or like doe a deer and I picked my favorite things probably because it had like the most range or whatever um and I sang it for her in the car and she was like well okay 
Um, I guess I could carry a tune. She wasn't, she didn't seem to be too afraid of it. Um, I also started playing the clarinet when I was in fifth grade. So I think that really sort of added to like musicality in general for oh, me. Oh, yeah. So you could read, read music then. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I played it all the way through 12th grade. Um, and so that has been very helpful in my in my career with the, the sight singing. It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of like indispensable, I think, for myself. Um, so that probably helped, you know, I knew generally like, and we always, we were always like belting around the house and singing and it it was all encouraged as well, you know? So, so that, yeah, that was that. And I had my stellar theater debut as Tina the Mouse. Oh, we also, they also, (laughs) they also added (laughs) the Shoop Shoop song. (laughs) This this keeps getting better. I have to see this. But here's the thing. All the mice sang it. (laughs) (laughs) Does he love you? I want to know. I don't know. But yet I think they cut like two of the Rogers and Mercy songs. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I would have loved to have been in the creative room. The the creative room when they were going through all this stuff. I mean, I know it it was all to like give, you know, kids more stuff to do and bigger parts and everything but like ooh that's going deep wow well yeah. 150 kids later yeah 6 hours later <laughs> 6 hours later <laughs> you know what this show needs it needs the shoop shoop song <laughs> yeah. yeah we don't we got 75 kids over here who haven't sung in 3 minutes what can we do for them i know Rogers and Hammerstein were pretty good but like i feel like they're really missing something here <laughs> oh my god oh no i have to go home and watch this immediately <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, but, so were you the only one in your family that, that yes. was interested in this? 1,000%. 1,000%. Really? Yes. Yep. How did you, how did you come out ahead like that? Um, I have no idea. My cousin, um, on my mom's side, she also sang and she also had a gorgeous voice. And so we would do all the high school shows together. But other than the two of us, that's the only link. That's the only, hmm. yeah, I know. It's very odd. It's very strange. My little brother liked to do theater, but like, and he loves theater. He like, he would like to work in theater, but not on stage. <laughs> like to be behind the scenes. Yeah. Like, you know, or like, like general management and stuff like that. Like he just loves the business of theater. Right. Oh, it's, um, a, well, it's a great business. Yeah, it is. Show business. And your career, uh, in re- I guess you began your career in regional theater. Yes. Playing Polly in Crazy for You down in Fort Lauderdale. Yes, which I just found out. The Broward Stage Door Theater, th- literally just today. They closed. Oh. Forever. Oh, no. <laughs> I know I shouldn't laugh, but I feel like, what, <laughs> what are the chances? Like Today. Today. And today is the one-year anniversary of Frozen, too. I know. Which we'll get into. I yeah. know. Yeah. It's, it's, it, I loved that theater. I loved it so much. Wow. And I, it was just like, a you know, the theaters are, they are expensive to run, and they are not massive money makers most of the time. No. So that's like I'll pour one out for Broward Stage or Theater cuz man, they like they fostered my love of musical theater right out of college. <laughs> I I lived in for in Broward County yeah. for half a year? Oh. Yeah. Why? I was in college with my computer science degree. I interned at AT&T? Oh. Was that what it was? God, I feel like I'm, I can't remember what company I worked for. What town it was, was it? It was uh, Paradise. I was in Paradise. But was it? Was it Paradise? <laughs> no, not a bit. I loved it. Not a bit. But I got my first motorcycle there. Well, that makes sense. That makes I, sense. I had nothing else to do. I had to tear up and down A1A. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Beachfront Avenue. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Vanilla Ice <laughs> up in here. Vanilla Ice. I was like, I can say the next line. I don't know if that's appropriate. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Where were we? You got me jumping all over the place. Um, what year oh, was this? Theater, yes. What year was this? That would have been 2002. 2002, so yes. 22. And I worked there for just about a year. Year 21. Year and a half, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, mm-hmm. 21, 22. Um, yeah, and I I was down there for a big stretch of time, about nine months. And then I went back the following fall to do another uh, another show. And then came back to the city and I got my equity card uh, in 2004 at the Goodspeed Opera House um, doing a show called Princesses. Mm-hmm. David Zippel and Matthew Wilder and Sherry and Bill Steinkellner of Cheers fame. Um, and it was uh, it was ridiculous. Like, ridiculous. It was so much fun. It was so much fun. It was me and Sierra Bogus and Lindsay Mendez and Jenny Fellner, Mary Faber. It, it, like, it, it's unreal. Like, 
the talent that they that they rounded up before you know anyone really knew that we were talented. <laughs> I love that though. I love Ugh. I love these interviews uh, w- with people who who have now made it. You know, we'll put that out there, right? The the made it in air yeah. quotes. And every everybody started yeah. some at the same place. Like yes. all of us are the same age. Like I started started at the same you know, with those high schools, and you're talking about your friends who were, yeah. you know, who, who's now an agent who's like yeah. got prepubescent dancing all exactly. over the internet somewhere, <laughs> um, or at least should be all over the internet somewhere. Soon, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah soon. You heard it here first. Yep. You, you sent it to me. I'll put it in the show notes for this episode. Great. Um, but yeah, I I am I am so impressed with with the community. That develops from from performing and and going through. I won't say a struggle, but it, it's 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 a it's a project. Yeah. You guys are building something beautiful, mm-hmm. and you're connected. Music connects people. Mm-hmm. Yep, and it's also it's one of the most grueling things yeah. to you know be part of a show's creation, no matter how big or small it is. Um, and so, mm-hmm. and yeah, it, it's instant family, and it works really well if you really like. The members of your family. <laughs> um, and in that case, we really, truly did. Like, a lot of us bonded very much over that. And we took it to the Fifth Avenue Theater a year later mm-hmm. in Seattle. And even more so, like, the you know, the especially the four of us got very, very close. Um, and it's like, that was also when we learned our first lesson of, when they tell you it's an out-of-town tryout and you're going to Broadway, that does not mean you're going to Broadway. <laughs> Yeah. It never does. Because at that point I didn't have an agent. So I got the uh, I got the call with the offer for myself of out of town and then for Broadway. They, uh-huh. you know, package it up. So just because you get an offer for Broadway doesn't mean that it's gonna come through or happen. So it was kind of like, you know, it was a, a massive lesson learned for me and also for my family, like, you know, how this business really does work. Mm-hmm. Cause, you know, we did another reading after we got home and it just didn't didn't take off. And so, but like for probably months way too long I probably hoped and was like no it's like totally gonna happen but you know it didn't and that's okay that's totally fine do you have any insight into into the creative process uh, like they keep trying to rework it or they keep trying like uh, are there shows that ever do multiple out of town tryouts and they just can't get it right and at what point do they say like you know what we just gotta cut our losses I don't know actually I think it's different with every show it's different with every show it just sort of depends on you know um uh, how hard, you know, how, how, I don't want to say how much they believe in it or like, I also think it's a business thing, you know, it's at mm-hmm. the end of the day, it comes down to money. And if there's no money, then there unfortunately can't be a show. What's great nowadays is that a lot of shows that are only doing, you know, out of town runs or off Broadway runs or whatever, they're, um, they're at least raising the money to do cast recordings, which is awesome. Oh yeah. Yeah. Which is really great because that helps to spread, you know, for licensing and, you know, for, for other, um, like regional companies to do it or high schools and whatnot. So that's that's a really great trend that I feel like has really picked up in the last like, I don't know, five five to seven years. Because I've done a lot of cast recordings for shows that I've never, never once, you know, set foot on stage. Hmm. Um, so, and that's just a really fun, that's a really fun thing. So um, I think that's, that's helpful too. Yeah. Well, that's kind of, I mean, a big driving force behind why Be More Chill is now about. Yes. To, mm-hmm. Or just opened on Broadway, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. It's the, the you record that music and like, you know, the that with any cast recording, you know, with Frozen, it's the the kid who's, you know, sitting in his living room in Oklahoma who can't come to New York and, and do, he can just open up Spotify and put on Frozen. It's mm-hmm. like, that's, it's genius. I mean, this is my favorite part about technology, you know, is just having it just kind of like beamed right into your living room. Or oh, like, yeah. Well, you, you and I, you and I are of the same... I don't know if this is a legitimate classification. Is uh, Xenials is the the between? Is it like two years where like we don't have a generation? <laughs> yeah, it's like well five. I think yeah. it's seventy eight to eighty three or seventy seven yeah. to eighty two or something. I think it's, yeah eighty two. They just and, came out with like they were like you're millennials. My husband, I was like <laughs> you're a millennial and I'm not. <laughs> you like to make fun of me for being two years older, but guess what, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> I remember analog. Ha ha. <laughs> yeah, oh well, yeah. Like grew up analog mm-hmm. and then had digital. I didn't have broadband until I went to college in ninety eight. Yeah. So I had my fifty six k modem. Oh my gosh. I remember going to the computer lab in oh, yeah, college, yeah. signing through, through like 18 different screens to get to your email. Like, yeah. it it blows my mind. And like, black screen with like orange writing. I read an article, yeah. I read an article the other day that was uh, the most popular chat app with teens right now is Google Docs. <laughs> That's... No joke. Why? Because it's not, you don't need your cell phone. 
You can be on your laptop uh-huh. in class, oh. learning, I put in air quotes, <gasps> taking a note, and you can sit you there and you're chat, chatting with the people. Yeah, you can <gasps> share it. You can tag people. You can do whatever you want. You and do- everyone can just like type all at the same time. But you're like, oh, no, I'm on Google Docs. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally learning right now. Oh, my God. Kids are so smart. Kid, I, that worries They'll me. They'll find their way. Worries wit, me, I man. know. What's going to happen, I mean, when your kids get, like, what is it going to be? VR. What's it going to be? Implants. Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm reading I'm, I'm reading a book right now called Sapiens. It came out a couple yeah, years yeah. ago. Yeah. So I started, Harari, yeah. Yeah. I started yeah. reading it. I literally cannot put it down. I feel, I'm the nerdiest nerd on the nerd planet. And I, it's like... I, I can't wait to get to the... Oh, I literally have it with me. Look, I'm a nerd. Um, <laughs> a, br- a brief history of humankind. But the last chapter is like, what's next? And it's basically like, we're going to be super powered and then we're going to be robots. Yeah. Like the superhuman. And I'm like, I don't I don't think I want to be alive for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of okay with the idea of uploading my consciousness into a cloud. But then the ethical part of me, because... Uh, I'm going to make a copy and there will be a me that exists in computer land. But then the physical essence of me is dead. And so there will be a copy of me that just dies. Right. And, you know, of course. And a copy of you that lives forever. Right. But the copy of me that dies, is the copy of me that lives forever going to feel guilt about that? I don't know. Are they going to have emotions? I guess it depends. Totally. Well, they should. We should. I should. We. I, and I also, one thing I got from this book, I was like, oh, humans really did ruin this planet. So I'm like, maybe it's our turn to go. <laughs> this conversation is going in a weird place. I know, right? <laughs> but I, God, I love it. <laughs> Philosophizing about the future of AI. I love AI. I love robots. My, my What I originally wanted to do with with my computer science degree was move to Japan and, oh. and, and write AI. Because... Artificial right. intelligence was just becoming the thing. Right. Or right. that or be on Broadway. Right. Well, so either I, I didn't do either. Yeah. So here I am. It's a hybrid of both, you know? Yeah. Right. Technology and theater. Would you upload your consciousness? If you had the, the choice right now of being like, Patty, you can live forever. I don't know. I would probably be like, what's everyone else doing? <laughs> 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 yeah. Mm, Casey did it. Oh, well, probably. And Casey comes in, hello, Patty. I how know. Are you? But she can still, yeah. You guys can still sing, though. Yeah. But Ooh. oh god, that would that would take out if you were in a computer mm-hmm. and you could just have a synthesized voice that was always perfect and never got tired. Well, that's the one great thing about it is like, oh, I wouldn't have to like navigate colds anymore, or like, you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't have to like be worried if I like got sick or whatever, you know, or like my cords are tired or. Uh, that that would be a, a definite plus. You know what's ac- okay? Part of this, I'm going to take this somewhere that's actually applicable to what we should be talking about. <laughs> Do you watch Future Man on Hulu? No. Um, it, it, I'll see if I can give a synopsis. Uh, there's anyway. There's this character that played by Haley Joel Osment in season two that uploads his consciousness, and so like his whole character is a hologram. So mm-hmm. he's it's like 200 years in the future or mm-hmm. something, and we're interacting with him as an AI, mm-hmm. and. He keeps debating with himself as, as to whether or not he should upgrade himself and patch his insecurities. Oh, this is like very Black Mirror. Yes. It's very much like literal literal like personality insecurities as a metaphor for like a security vulnerability in a mm-hmm. computer, right? He's like, should I, up, should I patch my insecurities? Should I patch my, my, my issues with my personality that cause me Ooh. to be human? Mm-hmm. And he, he eventually does it because he keeps like falling in love with – or he's falling in love with one of the characters and it's causing him, like, people make bad choices when they're in love. And he's like, fine, screw it. I'm just going to, I'm going to patch it and not be in love anymore. Ooh. It's, uh, right. This is above right? my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> so my, so then my question then is, and we'll, we'll get into this a little, a, a little bit, but like the, the mental health aspect mm-hmm. of. Oh, yeah. Of people's personalities. <laughs> would you, would you take all that with you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I would. I feel like that's that's made me who I am. Right. Dealing with that and like coming to terms with it and figuring it out and still day to day, you know, it's like I'd be so boring, I think. Just It'd be like the the Alan Rickman robot and Hit, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I mean, yeah. A depressed robot. Just yeah. That would that I love that character. <laughs> I lo- oh, I love me some Alan Rickman. Yeah, I don't know that I would patch anything up except maybe like I don't know, something like my food allergies. Like well, get rid of those. Ha- you wouldn't have to eat. Oh, that's It'd be true. irrelevant. See? 
See, I'm terrible at this. <laughs> I'm terrible at this. <laughs> <laughs> the listeners are like, God, just get on with it. Enough computer <laughs> crap. Talk about Broadway. Talk about Broadway. Okay, let's talk about Broadway. Um, you played Glinda in the first national tour of Wicked. I did. Yes. And that's a fun soprano role, but you had only belted yes. up until then. I had to learn how to sing soprano for it. It was terrifying. Did you go into the audition and like, oh, I can do this? Um, I had auditioned a bunch of times. And they they did not offer me the role, you know, after, like, when I went into audition at all. Um, I had had work sessions, you know. And and at one point, they said I they did not offer me the role because I my soprano was too weak. Because it was. Like, it was weak. But then after the Strata Jones closed, about six months later, I got a call. And they were like, do you want to? It was an offer. And I was yeah. like, well, yes. And then I was like, and they were like, it's in, like, two weeks. And I was like, <laughs> guess I should learn how to sing soprano. Um, so I went to, I had one lesson with Liz Kaplan, mm-hmm. the Broadway's absolute, oh my goodness, secret weapon, mastermind, vocal coach, powerhouse. Um, and so she gave me, you know, like some, some exercises, you know, like strengthening exercises and blah, blah, blah. And like, I really kind of faked my way through that. I'm going to be totally honest. There were some notes that like, I was like, that was really good, but like that whole opening. But the thing is, is that I feel like now I've been studying with Liz for two years. If I were to do it now, I would be so much better at it. <laughs> I hope, yeah. I just, because like, I learned to sing that soprano. I didn't learn to sing soprano. I've learned to sing those specific notes. You know what I mean? Those specific songs. I didn't right. learn to sing like, you know, like when someone's like belt this, I'm like, okay, because I know how to belt. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to sing soprano. But now, um, just because of all the work with Liz and I feel like, you know, I, I've got that now. So transposing that, to to Frozen now yeah. in Anna and Frozen did they did they kind of any did they transpose the music to a different key at all to like fit your voice because I like Kristen Bell I I don't think I don't picture her as a belter um, no they uh, they kept it in the original keys um, which are insane uh, I think I I, I I couple no all the all the my songs are all the same key as the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, which is nuts because if you've ever tried to mix belt the word door on an E while you're dancing, it's not easy. <laughs> I do that like once a day. Yeah, Ugh. no problem. It's still the part that I'm just like, I'm going <laughs> to open my mouth and let it fly and whatever comes out, comes out. It's like I had to get very comfortable with cracking on a Broadway stage because I, either, I, you know, I just crack and you're like, whatever, whatever. There's real problems out there. It's fine. <laughs> <I> <laughs> get guess, what you get. <laughs> yeah, not, not the end of the world. But, um, but like it's... It is the first two songs of the show are my my uh, my hardest for sure, um, because it's all up there in the D's and E's and the belting and the the like high mix belt and mm-hmm. um, but then once that's over, all the new stuff is is written in a bit of a lower place, um, but yeah, but not too much lower. It's just for some reason I think uh, I think maybe I'm more comfortable with it because it was not built around me, but like I was the only one developing it as a song, you know, as right. like a care as the, cause I've been, I've been the only person to play Anna since the beginning of this. Right. Uh, since the very first reading. When was that? That was three years ago in like April, May. That, that's fast. Yeah. Three years to now. Yeah. You know, yeah. To they get, were, to get in a, and it's already been open for a year. Yes, it has. Yeah. That is some fast workshopping. Yep. So we did a reading and then we did two labs, two four week labs, um, both on their feet to like stage it and whatnot. Went out of town to Denver and came back and opened it on Broadway and it's a year later. So well, it's like, yeah, it's, everyone keeps being like, it's been a year. And I'm like, it's been three. But, yeah. You know, yeah. It's been, it's been, yeah, longer than that. Yeah. Um, did you know what you were getting into? Like when you first received your call and you're like, hey, we got this, we got this project over here. Why don't you come in and uh, you uh-huh. know, read for this? You know, I knew that it was going to be huge and stuff. I also knew like when I went into that audition, sometimes you just, it just fits and it just feels right. And you never, like, it's always the ones that you're like, I have to play that part. I've got, I'm going to be devastated. You never get those. You don't ever get those. You just don't. It's the ones that you are just like, it's like a quiet sort of like this, like you don't want to talk about it out loud, but you're like, this is literally, this is made for me. So I left the audition, you know, for that first reading. And I was like, I think I might have gotten that. (laughs) And I, you know, I got a call and I was like, I, I definitely just got that. And then it went through some upheavals, you know, some some creative changes and whatnot. And so our futures were very unclear for a while in terms of, you know, but Michael Grandage came in and we did the first workshop together. And I, you know, was like, uh, we hit it off right away. And it was so much fun. It was even more obvious that I was like, this is like, 
this is my, this is my part. <laughs> but after that, because he had been brought on and he was, I was sort of grandfathered in for him, you know, he wanted to do his due diligence and have auditions and whatnot and kind of see everything else just to make sure he wasn't missing anything. Literally, there's, you just can't blame him for that. You know, it's like people are like, were you so? And it's like, no, I wasn't. I did everything I could in that workshop to show him, you know, and to show everyone that I was this role. Um, and, and then they ended up, you know, uh, they ended up going with me. Thank goodness. <laughs> and this is not your first Disney princess. No. Because, yeah, you were, no. it was in 06. Yeah, uh-huh. in the national tour of Beauty and the Beast. Yes. Uh, huh. A mini tour you, of that from uh, Atlanta were, Theater of the Stars. Yeah, you were Belle in Beauty yep. and the Beast there. Mm-hmm. How long was that yeah, mini tour? How long was that tour? Like three months. Well, that, yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. Do you like touring? Versus like sticking around. Are you are you more of a homebody? Or? You know, no, and any no, not anymore. I think then it was super fun because I was like young and single, and I didn't really have you know. It was like living the dream and going to you know like some different cities and stuff. But the Wicked tour was very hard for me. It was very hard, and we had like seven week sit downs. It wasn't like we were moving every week, you know. But it's just the climate changes. They they just do a number on your on your cords and on your, your health and whatnot. And I just, I like where I, oh, where lit- I live. Oh, literal, like weather climate. Literal yeah. climate, yeah. Like we went, with Wicked, we went from Las Vegas to Seattle. Oof. So we went from crazy dry to crazy wet. And then we went from Seattle to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I went to Hawaii. I'm sorry, I went to Hawaii with Wicked for like two months. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Life's hard sometimes. Well, it's so hard. I know. Well, I was like, oh, they're offering me the Hawaii leg. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Do you, get, do you have the option to turn it down? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Was there anybody who was like, no, nah, I don't like Hawaii? No. Oh, I wouldn't think so. I mean, so. I hope not. Right. I don't know. I've never been. Um, It's amazing. It's one of my favorite places in the entire world. Yeah. I need yeah. to go. I need yeah. to go. I go more being in New York. I go east. Right, of I course. I go to Europe all the time. Of course, but yeah. Yeah, Hawaii, not so much. It's it's quite a trek from here. Wow. Um, yeah, so you said that you like touring, but you're now you're yeah. not a homebody now? Yeah, or? I like being home. I, yeah. and, you know, I've done, a, in recent years, I've done a couple of like out-of-town productions. Like I went up to Goodspeed for four months to do Holiday Inn. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was, well, I mean, that's basically like being home though because you have two days off a week and it's like two hours away. <laughs> so you're coming back and forth, but like, I just, I like being here. And my husband shoots a TV show. He's Chicago Med in Chicago. So Mm -hmm. I I already have two homes. So I don't feel the need to like (laughs) add more to the list. So. Yeah. Yeah. I I do like The Affair. Yes. Yes. I'm a fan of of, uh, your husband's character on The Affairs. Yep. I know. I know. He's multi-talented, that one. He is. So so are you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, So Frozen. Yeah. So second Disney princess. Is this... Is this something that, like the 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 princess type of character, is this something that you're drawn to for a particular reason? Because I I feel like I really like how Disney, especially lately, has really made their yeah. their women are very strong yeah. women. Yeah, they're like heroines now, yeah. as opposed to like print, you know, the old school princesses. You know, like they have a goal and they, you know, even from the the you know when Little Mermaid came out and stuff and Beauty and the Beast and whatnot, like it's it they they just keep getting stronger and stronger as they go along. Um, I think. I grew up uh, as we a massive Broadway fan, mm-hmm. but I was also raised a massive Disney fan. My dad is a huge, huge, huge Disney nerd. I think we have the same parents. Yeah, maybe that's weird. Are you my brother? <laughs> mm, yes, surprise. That's why I'm here. <laughs> this is actually <laughs> to introduce myself. Are Hi. we twins? Y- yes, my. <laughs> yes. If I say yes, does that make it true? No. Um, that's, but like, you know, we, we would go to Disney and Disney World and stuff. And I mean, I grew up with all of the, the old school cartoons, like silly symphonies and stuff and all of the, anything Disney we would see and, or would be brought home. As soon as the Disney channel came into existence, of course we, Had that was, it. yeah. And it's not, we weren't like rolling in money at all. That was like, that was a legitimate luxury, but there was just no option. We had to get it. All right, we didn't get it for a while. It, it, I always would pay attention to when they started giving it away for free. Yeah. Remember when cable used oh, to yeah. do it? Yeah. Yep. Like, mm-hmm. oh, you can get Disney Channel for free for a couple of months. And then I'm like, okay. I got to keep watching it. And sometimes they forget to turn it off. So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that was, that, it was so like, I think the the Disney, because I was so closely, you know, I feel like already entrenched in Disney and theater. That That's like, you know, multiple dreams coming true and just multiple things that I love all in one place. So like, 
Yeah. So I always, I did always want to be a, a, like a Disney, a Disney princess, but I, now I'm glad that I get to be the Disney heroine. You know what I mean? Yeah. I like to say she's a heroine who just happens to be a princess. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. And on stage, you, you and Casey have, uh, of <clears throat> course, amazing chemistry. Yes. Is that, I mean, is is that acting or like how close are you and Casey like in real life? In very close. Are you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like we sisterly? found out. Yeah. We found out when we um, started the first workshop that we live uh, half a block away from each other. No kidding. Literally. Yeah. Half a block. Mm -hmm. I see her on the street sometimes with her son and oh. it's lovely. Or I'll see her son with his nanny and mm -hmm. I'll like get to say hi to him. And he's three, you know, and it's like the best thing is when he sees me and says, hi, Patty. I'm like, oh. God, you're like my little nephew, like Aww. you're my little buddy. Yeah, we are. We're very close. Our husbands knew each other before we knew our husbands. So there you go way back, too. I yeah. love this industry. I know, right? It's so, it's so crazy. Yep. And so we and we've always known each other, but we've never been friends. Like, you know, super, but we have a lot of mutual friends. And they're the kind I always say they're the kind of friends that I'm like, oh, if you like Casey, then I'm gonna like Casey. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, it's not it's not acting. It's total like we clicked from from the start. And it's also like really amazing to have someone to go through all of this with. Like both of us yeah. have one other person who knows exactly the hard times, you know, the times when you get overwhelmed or when you're tired or when you have to call out for the first time and you're sobbing because you don't want to. Like, you know, we I we take care of each other. She literally takes care of me. Like, mm -hmm. you know, our, our my first panic attack in Denver that I had. Uh, calling out wasn't really an option at that point. Um, and she she snapped into like mother mode and like, you know, got me soup and like let me like sleep in her bed and just like, yep. I, and throughout the whole show, she was just like, and so that's something I'll I'll never, ever, ever forget. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, it sounds like you guys are like really friends and you will yeah. be friends forever. Yeah. Oh and, yeah. And I want to, I want to come back to the panic attack in a second, but to, continuing on the family, the family bit, um, I saw that it was, I think it was Ryan Redman who posted something the other day. Zoe Glick, uh, yeah. your li little Anna. Oh, my little peanut. <laughs> yeah. She, she had her birthday yep. and there was like a, a video of the whole cast singing yes. happy birthday and everything. And are you, is it, I mean, you've mentioned this before that it becomes a family, but do you really feel like attached to these kids? And especially oh. like Zoe, who's little you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, every time a new set of kids comes in, I'm like, I'm done. I'm not getting attached to these ones. It's too sad when they leave. And two seconds later, I'm like, I love them so much. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, it's like the nature of the business. You know, we've, we've had some real tough goodbyes, really tough goodbyes. Um, and the thing is with the little girls, it's like, I, I tell them all the same thing. I'm like, you are leaving for the best reason ever. You're leaving so that you can grow up into a young woman. You know, it's not, that's amazing. This is has nothing to do with your talent. That's the great thing. It's only because you're actually growing and you have to go out and like take over the world because the world needs you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. I know. They're I, my, I have a special relationship with those little, the, the, the little girls. They're so just the, the best. The girls, the girls who were in the workshop, mm -hmm. they're not the ones. They, the so Zoe and the and the other ones, they weren't part of the no. workshop. Nope. So and we had Denver, of course. The kids didn't go to Denver. This different set of kids nope, in this Denver. Is, uh huh. Yep. So right now, we don't have any of the original kids anymore. Um, our last original kid, Matea Conforti, left in November, mm -hmm. and she actually was one of the four of us that was in that very first reading. Oh. So it was me, young Anna, who I don't know how her parents made her not grow for three years, but she did not grow. And then all of a sudden, it was like whoop. Um. Kevin Delagula, who plays Oaken, and Greg Hildreth, who is Olaf. Yep. He was with us until uh, last month. Yep. So that was it. Four. It's like Survivor, Frozen Edition. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you and Casey are, are still, you're still going. Oh, we're still, oh yeah. And you feel, you, you're telling me uh, before we started recording that it's it's a very, like, you feel a lot of ownership yeah. over this. Yeah. Because you, like, you created it from nothing. We worked so, so hard, you know? And it's like we had, the, the movie is such an amazing template, like, such a great, you know, but it's a different medium. So, you know, we took what they what they did there, and then we all worked together to expand on it and to actually literally bring it to life. Um, and it's my show is incredibly physical. It's and I'm never off stage. And if I am off stage, it's because I'm changing into a costume in like 20 seconds. <laughs> so, well, you change costumes on stage. I know. Yeah, yeah. That, isn't I was, that crazy? You were singing while changing yes. while on stage, and I was like, oh, okay, that, I know that's special. Yep. Yep. So, and you know, it's like I'm I'm running around and I'm, there's one of my favorite moments. Oh my gosh. Every, it's like, it's actually backstage that it happens is after I leave, you know, the, the act two number, opening act of 
the opening of Act Two, Huga. Huga, Huga, I don't know. I still Huga. cannot pronounce that correctly. Um, Huga. I leave and I, you know, I say after I come out in my Anna dress and I exit stage right. And then I immediately sprint around the back to go to the upstage stage left wing. And this is when the curtain is coming in and there's a kick line in front of the curtain. But behind the curtain, they're doing this massive set change in 20 seconds. And there's like 10 crew guys doing this huge like getting rid of that so that it's like the most Broadway moment that I could, because it's also like that kick line music that's very like, you know, like rockets. Yeah. Um, and I'm running around to do a costume change, watching like our entire crew move this massive Oak, wandering Oaken's trading post and sauna. It's like, it's just like, it's mind blowing. Every night it blows my mind. And it's that kind of thing where you're like, we worked so hard for that. And now it's just like, boop. Yep. And that's after I do a like 20 second quick change out of my, the climbing clothes into my Anna travel outfit, right. which is five people. Is this the most physical show you've done? Like, are you in the best physical shape in yes. this one? I eat Shake Shack a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa Strata Jones was also um, quite physical with all the dancing and the cheering and the basketballing and the running and blah, blah. But I had more Maybe time off stage Xanadu in that one. was all roller skating. Yeah, too. that was yeah. all, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was short though. That was like 90 minutes. Oh, yeah. Ugh. So it was just like, boom. This one is like, once you start, it's over. You know, it, it goes so fast. And I have a minute during Let It Go into intermission, and then it's like right back on. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's honestly, I think one of the things, I like I know this now, it's, it's one of the things that I'm going to look back on and be the most proud of of anything in my life. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, you're going to be remembered for it. Like, this is one of those, like, iconic roles that yeah. when you think of... I hope so. Yeah, original <laughs> cast. <laughs> you yeah. will be. I'm telling you, you will be. <laughs> when you think of original cast of some of the greatest shows yeah. that are that have ever graced the stage, like, you and Anna in Frozen, like, it's yeah. going to go hand in hand for Evs. That's good, because I'm still going to be there in 50 years. <laughs> 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 give me the hip replacement surgery, give me the Botox. <laughs> do you want to be a snowman? <laughs> it's, it's, there's not even, like, a role I could, like, age into in this show. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, everyone, you could kind of yeah. be, you could be Weaselton eventually. You know what I say? You know what I say? When you need stunt casting in like ten years, I'm going to come back and I'm going to be Oaken. There you go. I mean, that's the best job on Broadway because he has one song and it's amazing, and then he goes back and sits in his dressing room again. And I'm like, an Oaken. I mean, if Olaf can be a lady, why can't Oaken be a lady? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, she's a businesswoman, so that's where I'm aiming towards. <laughs> Just always, always go back to okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you don't mind, can we yeah. get back into the first time you called out? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The first time I called out on Broadway, oh, it's I still cry when I call out. I don't like calling out. Really? Yeah, I do. I just called out on Saturday night. I had done the matinee, and I was like, I am. I my I I hadn't called out for a month, and I also hadn't missed a show that wasn't for other work in like three months. <laughs> so <laughs> I had been working for like, you know, and it, my voice was just like, I was like, this is not going to be a show that people on Saturday night want to <laughs> go and see. And I still cried. Um, but the first, yeah, the first time I called out, I, I don't think this was the first time. It was one of the, it was in the beginning. It was like April. So it was close to after, um, after we opened. Um, I, I had a panic attack. It was a Tuesday, I believe. And I was like, I just like, could not be me at all. And I couldn't see people and I couldn't like, you know, I, I was just incapacitated. And um, and I always say that like, it doesn't matter what job I, I did, I would not have been fit for work. You mm -hmm. know, whether I sat like alone in an office cubicle all day, I wouldn't have been, I would have been useless there as well. So, so I decided to call out and it was a good decision. I took a couple of shows off, you know, it's like, it's, it really does a number on your body. I don't think people realize that, that it's not just like your brain or like you're crying. Like it's really like, it's getting back to like a very, getting your equilibrium back takes a little while. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and I posted about it the next day, not really thinking, you know, on Instagram, I just was like, well, this is why I called out and this is, you know, something that I, that I deal with on a daily basis. And I did, I didn't realize that it was going to be such a popular topic. And and it was. And it turned into, it got picked up by, you know, many, many news outlets. And I got oh, the opportunity to do so much great work for so many different organizations because May is National uh, Mental Health Awareness mm -hmm. Month. So I got to like 
it was like right, it was April that I did it. So it was like, I got to just go and speak out to so many different, you know, uh, areas of, of, you know, people and stuff. And and I still, I have a, a, like a bi- these binders. I have like scrapbooks basically. And I save every single piece of fan mail that I get that really? is that that is someone telling me their story or saying thank you for speaking out. And I have like three binders full of it now. Because wow. it's good for me to be like, look at this many people that like I'm not alone either. You know, they like to know that they're not alone, but like I also need that. So, um, so it's been, and I was like, oh, it was that moment where I was like, I found my platform. There it is. This is my like life's work, you know? I thought it was just rescuing puppies, but like I'll figure out a way to meld those two together. Yeah. Puppies make you happy. Yeah. I mean, I, I, <laughs> puppies, puppies, pets in general, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. It's scientifically proven. Yes. I, it is. But uh, yeah, I want to call out, I mean, what people see on social media more often than not is not who that person is as a real person. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, so like you've got, like Laura Benanti is very good. I respect her. She talks Ugh. about her, her, um, autoimmune disorder yep. mm-hmm. as a lot and she you know hates when she calls out she yep. feels guilty about it and I yep. was talking with Bonnie, Bonnie Milligan on this podcast mm-hmm. um, and she she was telling me she feels like an obligation to yeah. use her 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 time in in the spotlight right mm-hmm. you know for lack of a better term yeah. to promote LGBTQ rights because yes. that's all about what she was being you know, people are focusing on that because of head over heels and yep. and whatnot like do you do you feel that same sort of obligation is it an obligation or like desire uh desire it's sort of like this has happened and i've been put on the, on this stage mm-hmm. you know and this is you know it's it's a it's a massive worldwide you know it's disney it's a disney Broadway show. And um, and the great thing is Disney has been so supportive of, of everything. So it's not even like, you know, they want they want me to be me and they want me to, you know, to to do this and to talk about it and stuff. And so, yeah, it's sort of like, I don't want, I mean, of course it's like about like, what am I going to do next in my career and all that stuff. But it's also like, well, while, while I'm here, <laughs> let's talk about real things. Yeah. Because there's a lot more people listening than, you know, if I wasn't in in a Broadway show, what, just in general. Yeah, what what brought on the panic attack, though? Like, you, a month after opening, it tends everything's to happen, going great. Well, that's the thing. It's like, it's it's not a, it's not a circumstantial thing. It's just, it's a, it's a disease. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a chronic disorder. And so nothing, it doesn't have to, there are certain things that will trigger panic attacks and anxiety attacks, but it doesn't always, it can just come out of nowhere. And it's just something, you know, just not, not just glitching in the brain and it just doesn't, Connections aren't being made, and then it's you know all, all heck breaks loose. <laughs> hmm. I'm I'm really getting into this a lot. Like personally, myself, I this is actually the first time I will ever mention this on this podcast. Was um, about eight months ago, I believe, six or eight months ago, I was diagnosed with OCPD. Oh, what's that? Obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Huh. So it's different from OCD. Okay. It's not like, you know, right. typical OCD stuff. Mm-hmm. Personality disorders are much different. So the the high level view of this is that you can't I can't see the forest through the trees. Okay. So sometimes I get so hyper focused on little details uh-huh. that I can't step back and just like enjoy enjoy where I am or let go of some small detail that's causing me stress see, and anxiety. I feel like people listening to you right now are probably like, "Wow, I should really look into that because that sounds like something I have." You know what I mean? Like that's like just you talking about it is like going to spark people to be like, maybe that's what it is. It's not like, you know, because I'm sure you're probably hard on yourself about it, right? Oh, yeah. Well, I I was, I am and I'm I'm not. I I am in that I'm very conscious and very intentional about like mm-hmm. what I want to focus on now. Mm-hmm. And I actually am taking a little bit of medication for it, which mm-hmm. is immediately just like, whoa, yeah. this I can't believe I was living like this for so long. Uh, same. Same. And I know medication's not for everyone. You know what I mean? We're not doctors, disclaimer, blah, blah, blah. But like it changed my life. You know, it, it did. I, I totally agree. And, and this, therapy. Also talk, yes. talk therapy. It's just, yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If if I ever win big awards, I'm like, I'm first and foremost going to thank my wife and my kids and then my therapist. Seriously. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. But but it's it's listening to, it, researching for this particular day, um, I was actually a little bit nervous, if I'm being honest, because I mean... We, we've never met before this, but um, knowing how much and how outspoken you are about mental health, I knew this was going to come up. Yeah. And I was debating, I was talking to my wife, and I was like, do I want to go into this about myself? Do I want to share this? And I, and then I made the decision. I said, yes, I think I just need to be authentic. Yeah. And that's what I respect. I respect that so much about you and, and Laura and Bonnie and everybody else and you know Kristen Bell and Mark Ruffalo and everybody else on a platform 
I put myself in with all these other people. Sorry about that, everybody else. Um, <laughs> that, that people, I think people are afraid to talk about this. Oh yeah, there's it's a mass it's a massive stigma because everyone thinks it's something that's wrong with them, with right? Them as a as how they their personality, you know, and it's not. It's just it's like you just got that roll of the dice when your brain was made. <laughs> when when I got the diagnosis, mm-hmm. I was relieved. Yeah. Yes. Did you feel the same way? Because I was finally, I finally had an explanation. Yep. Yep. From the very first moment in college when I was like, oh my goodness, thank God. I'm not just crying over this boy because I like love him. No, I wasn't. But, it was because there was, you know, it was just like a, a rut that I couldn't pull myself out of. And yeah. when my, one of my professors was like, have you ever thought about maybe you're clinically depressed? And I was like, no. And so that was sort of the beginning. And what's great now is that, um, so many of the letters that I get are from like 11 to 14 year olds. Really? So what's amazing is that they have a name for it now. And that's like half the battle. You know what I mean? And it's not a thing where you can be like, oh, I blame it on my anxiety. It's not that. It's like they have that, that name is an automatic tool to like do research, reach out to other people, you know, have something in common with someone else instead of like, and and, because when I was, you know, 10, it was like I was being dramatic. And I'm sure some of it was probably me being dramatic, but like, <laughs> you know, but like it, it all, it all makes sense now. It all clicks. It's like, that's why my mom had to pick me up at school because I was crying and couldn't stop and didn't know why, you yeah. know? So that is, I think that's a massive step is that people are saying, you know, my child, you know, has anxiety instead of being like getting frustrated with your child and like not knowing and yelling and you know what I mean? It's like we have a specific way to, that we can go about this now. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, yeah, exactly. As a parent too, I, I look at my two kids and they're both, they're totally different. Mm-hmm. But my older one is very, very sensitive. Yeah. And it was seeing how he needs to, like when when one, my wife and I, when one of us like scolds him or, or yells at him for something, um, which thankfully doesn't happen too much, uh, he, he, he immediately needs to be held and, and reassured by the person who just yelled at him. Okay. And as an adult, I'm the exact same way. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize until parenting oh. and knowing that about him, I was like, can we try that? Like, I did, we got in a fight. Can I just have a big hug? Oh. And it, it works wonders. Yeah. And I, I, love, I love being able to talk about it. I love going to therapy. Mm-hmm. I, Jesus, just people yeah. listening. Therapy's not bad. Yeah. It's like, the, I equate it to like, if you have diabetes, you're not going to be like, you know what? I'm just going to handle this myself. It's cool. You're yeah. like, no, you're going to go to the doctor and you're going to get some some meds and, you know, or change your diet. You're going to change, you know what I mean? You're going to mm-hmm. change something. Right. So that's what I, you know, that's how I sort of spell it out to people. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I actually want to quote you, um, you from a refinery29.com article, and I'll, I'll put the link to the article in the show notes for this. And you've said, all I can do is sit on my couch and feel absolutely nothing because to feel anything would mean that my soul was victorious. And I'm not convinced that I have a soul at this moment. I wrote that? You wrote that. Holy crap. I should be a writer. You, oh, <laughs> it was beautiful. The whole article. Wow. Absolutely beautiful. You know, I haven't read it in a while. And I, 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 every so often someone will bring it up and I'll retweet it again and stuff. But like, wow. Is, and that, Excuse and that's me why, while I'd be impressed with myself. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, that, is that a struggle, that, like a daily thing or like every uh, like with a medication, it's a monthly thing or a quarterly thing that you come in and you're like, oh God, I just don't feel like a person right now. There was, you know, it's... There, in high stress periods, it happens more often. I also tend to sort of push through a lot of things and get through stuff. And then all of a sudden, they'll come up from underwater and I'm like, oh my God, and everything just cracks, you know? Um, it, it's, and again, there's certain triggers, you know what I mean? It's like, like alcohol is, is one that is like, that can be a trigger it's, for a lot of people, actually. Um, and so it's, I haven't had a panic attack knock on wood in in a, a while, but I've had times. One last week where I was like, I feel like this is coming on, and I'm like, I'll text my husband. He'll be like, What do you need? And I'm like, I think I'm okay, because now I know what it feels like when it starts, and I can start to fight it right away. Yeah, it doesn't always work, but and I find that if I just sort of like push it off, if I'm like, I mean, it's fine, it's fine, it's gonna come back eventually anyway, and it'll probably be worse. So it's it's like I have to ask myself, is this the t- the kind that I can like? quiet down, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or is it the kind that I need to let happen because it needs something needs to come out? What yeah. does that feel like to you? Like wh- when you feel it coming on? Oh, there's like you? a there's like a like a black seed of like it's it's like a pit. 
And it's right in like, I call it my heart guts, like right there, right between your heart and your stomach. The solar plexus. Yes. And it's right there. And you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> and, uh, and it just kind of like uh, grows or just like, you know, sits there and festers. And, and then it's a lot of crying. Yeah, because it, it feels like my body actually wants to get something out, you know, because yeah. it'll I'll want to throw up, but I don't have to throw up, you know, but, which is why I think the sobbing is is so big. And then when that's over, then I sit and I'm catatonic and I usually put on like like superhero movies. <laughs> yeah, inspirational stuff. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like they're colorful and they're, they're you know, they're high stakes, but, you know, it's going to be okay. And also like that's actually why I became such a huge fan of Mar mm -hmm. all the Marvel movies. Is because that's what it, my go-to was. Um, and so they just, they're fast-paced. You don't have to think too hard, but they still, they're not mindless, you know? Mm -hmm. There's something about that for me. So that's my, that's like my my thing of choice. I think I, I want to give a big, uh, I guess, shout out to Colin too, your husband. Oh, yeah. Because, and and you too, to, to have two people, um, I guess, in a relationship who are, I, when I first got my diagnosis, part of it was relieved, like I said, but the other part was like, oh crap, is my wife going to think I'm less of a person? Mm -hmm. Will I, will I, am I being perceived as weak? Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing for males as well, because it's very, it's a very small percentage of people with diagnosed mental illnesses that are male. It's mostly female. Because the men are, refuse to stop and ask for directions. That's exactly Stereotypically, it. yeah. You're correct. Yeah, well, because, you know, society is gender norms. Yeah. It's made men feel like they have to be, you know, the strong one and the, the, you know, so that's like, that's, that's huge. Yeah. So yeah. Colin, if you're listening and I hope you are. Yeah. Thank you for supporting Patty. He's the best. He's the best. Yeah. Yep. He, he does seem like a good guy. He's, yeah, he's my number one. The other day, Colton and Cassie from The Bachelor came in to see you in yes! the show. Yes. Because you're friends with Colton, yes. right? So Colton came with um, uh, Jason, who is also a contestant on last season's Bachelorette. They came in uh, August to come see the show. And we had just sort of connected over Twitter. Jason has a brother who works in theater. Um, and so, it, you know, he's just a big theater fan as well. And he had already followed me on Twitter when he became a Bachelorette contestant. So they were tweeting and I was tweeting with them. Then they you know, set it up. And then afterwards, um, Colin was in town. So we all went out for drinks afterwards and we just like really hit it off. And we hit it off with Jason's brother and his husband and, um, you know, with Colton. And it, it was just sort of friendships were born. And then and then Colton was named The Bachelor, and I was like, okay, this is crazy. <laughs> Such a lifelong, like, you know, like, dedication to this show, and all of a sudden I'm accidentally friends with The Bachelor. So you're like, cool. Um, but it was really it was really interesting, too, because, I mean, he went completely incommunicado for a month while he filmed. There was no communication. He came back, and, you know, he was he didn't say a single word to me. I spoiled it for myself, though, before I watched this, the show. Because I do live tweet, and I didn't want to, like, I didn't want to be, like, I don't know, like, rooting for the wrong person or like, I don't know. I didn't want to act like, I just wanted to know. And it was also interesting. I got like a whole lesson in editing because I was like, huh, interesting how they edit that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so when he finally made his pick, they were, you know, coming here to, um, and he had talked about wanting to come see the show again and bring her. And he was like, we have a free night. It's going to be Thursday. We're going to come see the show. And so it, it was their first official public date. That right. My husband and I crashed. <laughs> so they came to the show sitting next to my husband. <laughs> and then we all went out for drinks afterwards. <laughs> so our, their first date was a double date oh, that's with so, me. That's fun, though. <laughs> yeah. That's so much fun. They're great. She's like, oh, my gosh. She's just the best. She's the best. But So how did that work? I, I saw photos, press photos of, of him up on stage and, and with a mic. Uh, so what, what, was oh, he doing, yeah. what was he doing on stage? Um, that we, we did a big uh, sensible rose ceremony-ish welcome for them. You know, after, after the show, we got them up on stage and just sort of, you know, asked them a couple of questions. And it was, it was actually really funny. They told a story that I don't know that it made it out there, but um, during, uh, there's one line, you know, like, do you know his last name? You know, that Christoph asks Anna and mm -hmm. like, what's his last name? And she says, of the Southern Isles. And they laughed. They were like, well, it was funny because when he came to my hometown for hometown dates, he thought my last name was Rudolph. Her last name's Randolph. <laughs> <laughs> so they were like, we literally were like, <laughs> so they told, you know, they told that story. It was, yeah, it was just, it was lovely. That's fun. Yeah. And she really, she's like, oh, she's so energetic and she's so funny and she's so charming and she's like, I know everyone's making this like she's 23 years old. How's she's so much more mature than that? Can I ask you a personal question? Yes. Not that I haven't already. 
Um, That's personal at this point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like at, at, at the level, like, you know, a lead on Broadway, originating roles, you're on TV, blah, 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 blah. I'm sure there are people that want to be next to you in physical proximity and emotional proximity all the time to like have some of the fame, have some of the, the success rub off on them. Right. How, how do you, how do you make new friends and figure out who's genuine? I feel like I have a pretty good BS meter when it comes to that. Um, I'm also like, I'm pretty transparent. You know what I mean? Like I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm very open. I'm very friendly. I'm very friendly to everyone. Mm -hmm. So like, I mean, sometimes I'm sure that probably gets me in trouble. (laughs) Um, But like, I don't know. It's, It's also a pretty insular life right now. You know, I go to the theater where my friends are. Mm -hmm. I do the show. And I go home to my husband and my dogs. And so there's not really an opportunity to sort of like, you know, make new friends unless Mm -hmm. it's like some crazy thing like that. Um, But yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of it. I have, I still have the same best friends that I've had since I was four years old. Um, And just, you know, and two best friends from Melissa Strada Jones and the same six best friends from college. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, it's, it's nice to like, you like, even when you were like talking, listing my resume, I was like, wow, I, I, I do a lot of things. <laughs> I just, I just don't think about it like that. You know, it's like, I, cause I know what it's like to do the daily grind of it all. And so yeah. it doesn't, it's not always super glamorous and it's not always super like, you know, like it's, n- it's not easy. Um, but I just, I don't know. I like to make sure that I, keep my, keep my, you know, my, my real family and friends as close as possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we are running out of time here. Um, gosh, the Muddy Paws, you're into <gasps> animal rescue. Muddy Paws Rescue. Yeah, Muddy Paws Rescue. If you rescue. want a puppy, adopt, don't shop. I yeah, give, me a, give me a quick plug for that. Muddy Paws Rescue is amazing. It is an organization based in New York City. It's foster-based, so they don't have an actual shelter. It's uh, run by a woman named Rachel Ziering, who is just, oh my goodness, she's taken, she, I think they, she established it two years ago, and they've, uh, I don't even know, over 2,000 dogs or something have been adopted. Um, and so they they bring dogs from the South. They pull dogs from shelters, kill shelters, and bring them here. And they adopt them. And they have, you should follow them on Instagram. Their Instagram content is golden. It's the best. So Muddy Paws Rescue. Um, I, whoops, look. Um, it's, it's either muddypawsnyc.org or just go to their, go look at Muddy Paws on Instagram and you'll find all the information and whatnot. Muddypawsrescue.org, yeah. There it is. Yep. Hey, hey. Yeah, I got it here. <laughs> Ooh, moneypawsrescue.org. Yeah. Um, but that's if you are considering, you know, adopting a furry friend, puppy, older dogs, adult dogs, small, large, they literally have it all. Okay. So on this podcast, there are three standard questions that I ask everybody. Okay. Number one, very simply, what motivates you? <gasps> Ooh. The promise of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Should I get out of bed? Yes, it's, coffee. It's on a very small scale. <laughs> what motivates me? I mean, probably my, I would say my family and, and my husband. That's, that's what, you know, that's at the end of the day, like who I want to be happy and be proud of me and, and whatnot. Nice. Okay. So number two, what advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now starting out down a similar path? Ah, um, I always like to say that so much about, especially like in that middle school, high school area, you know, college even, everyone's trying to, you're always trying to fit in. You're trying to fit in with the crowd so that, you know, and not like be weird or be, you know, different. But the thing is, is that that's what makes actors, that's what makes successful actors successful is because they're different. Even if you walk into an audition room and you see like seven different versions of me there, it's the, I'm the only me. So I feel like embrace what makes you different and, and embrace what makes you unique, you know? And so, and the sooner you do that, I I feel like it'll open up a whole world of possibilities and, you know, in terms of like, in terms of acting and auditioning and stuff and always make sure it's fun. Always make sure it's still fun. Good. I like that one. Okay. So last question, if you could only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want, (sighs) what show would you see? It doesn't have to be running now, right? No, any show. God, that's so hard. I mean, I'll say the first thing that popped into my head, probably the original Broadway company of The Secret Garden. <laughs> really? Yes. Wow. That was the show that I I 
I, you know, I'd seen Cats and the Starlet Express and stuff, but that was the one that really made me fall in love with theater. Um, and I saw it twice. I had, it was my senior year of high school show. I played Mary Lennox. And now we're in the St. James, which is where the Secret Garden was. Yep. So it all, it's, yeah, that feels, that feels right. I know we're short on time. I, I did Secret Garden once and the, <laughs> I won't, I won't say the name of the production company or where it was because it was not so good. Um, our secret garden, uh, the the company had rented like trees and shrubberies and mm-hmm. stuff without checking the size of the cargo elevator <gasps> and basically nothing fit. Oh. So we had a couple shrubs on stage for the big <laughs> reveal. And it was not... Not great. Not great. Okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> so we can get more of you on Instagram and Twitter at Patty Murin and, of course, MuddyPawsRescue.org. And then, oh, yeah, on Saturday, May 11th at 10 a.m., you are you are co-hosting um, with Alex from Dear Evan Hansen. Yes. Uh, the NAMI Walks, is yes. that how you say that? Yeah, it's the largest um, mental health fundraising walk that exists. And yeah. Uh, it's it's basically an organization that really focuses on taking the stigma out of mental health and, you know, making everyone comfortable and, and educating people on it and whatnot. So we are very excited. Alex and I are Twitter friends. We have not officially met in person yet. Um, so this is sort of like our, like, you know, first blind date. Um. <laughs> so it's sort of like The Bachelor, but... Exactly. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Uh, yeah. um, so, any- so we're very, very excited for that. It's just, oh, it's, again, the, the amount of... Uh, support and and love that's already been you know thrown our way and people donating money and stuff it's just it's incredible that's fun wonderful yeah so nami n-a-m-i-n-y-c dot org yes. and you can get there come walk with us anything else you, you want to you can run but why run when you can walk <laughs> <laughs> how, about, how about some shake shack <laughs> that's what I'm gonna eat for lunch <laughs> get more of me at theater underscore podcast on Instagram and Twitter facebook.com slash official theater podcast listen and subscribe rate and review wherever you're listening now this is produced by Jillian Hockman and thank you to Jukebox the Ghost for our intro and outro music Patty my gosh this has been so much fun it's been so much fun thank you for chatting oh of course thanks for having me Make the world a little colorful